Next one up is Leslie Doohan from the Transamotic uh, trans Power. And I'd like to call Leslie to the stage. Thank you so much, and thank all of you. I mean, you all, thank you so much. This is really, really exciting to be here. Um, I'm going to be talking about nuclear power for my 12-minute session, about, uh, well, the industry's past, why it's in its present situation, and most interestingly, where it might be in the future. Now, nuclear power today is really at a crossroads. There's, whoop. This is not for Oh, there we go. All right. So <laughs> especially since Fukushima, uh, there are a number of countries like Germany and Italy that are moving to ban nuclear power entirely, whereas other countries like China are um, really expanding their nuclear research and building a large number of plants. And on top of all of these political machinations, there's also a great deal of new nuclear technology that's being developed that's, uh, sorry, I'm echoing a little bit. There we go. Um, and this new technology is focusing on solving nuclear's traditional problems of safety and waste production. Now, before I get too far into this, I'm going to give like a one minute description of how nuclear reactors work. Just, just as a background for everyone. So nuclear reactors are nothing more than a fancy way of boiling water. So totally true. So over here on the left side of the picture, you have the reactor core. And inside the reactor core, there's a large, stable number of what's called nuclear fission reactions occurring. And these nuclear fission reactions generate a great deal of heat that's used to boil water into steam. The steam is used to drive a turbine, powers a generator, which produces electricity. And so this, this is kind of like the way a coal plant works, say. In a coal plant, you just use burning coal to boil water into steam. So you can kind of think of the reactor vessel on the left there as just being a black box that produces heat. It doesn't really matter what's inside it, for the most part. But today, what I'm going to be talking about is what's inside this black box, like what it was in the past, what it is now and what it could be in the future. Back in the early days of nuclear, so in the 1950s and the 1960s, there was just this enormous sense of freedom about what you could do with the technology. So people were coming up with designs for, say, reactors that instead of being cooled with water were cooled by liquid mercury or salt or lead, molten lead even. And they had designs for nuclear-powered airplanes, nuclear-powered cars. This is the Ford Nucleon, which unfortunately was never produced, even though it would have been amazing. Um, <laughs> and nuclear-powered submarines, which were, of course, produced. Um, though nowadays, the nuclear industry has really lost that diversity, and it's stagnated on just one type of design. And it turns out to be a really interesting story as to why nuclear is, is stuck on this one design. Um, so in the late 40s, early 1950s, the US spent a great deal of time and money developing reactors for nuclear-powered submarines. And they were able to successfully do this. And the first nuclear-powered submarine was the Nautilus, which is shown in this picture. Then later on in the 1950s, the US wanted to have the first commercial nuclear power plant. And they wanted to do this as quickly as possible. And in particular, they wanted to get these up and running before the USSR did, just as a point of national pride. So instead of spending years developing a new type of reactor, they just took the submarine reactor and put it on land. And it worked well enough, but you're taking a submarine reactor and putting it on land. There are pretty different design <laughs> requirements. It's not totally optimized. There are some problems there, but it worked OK. And actually, the first reactor built with this nuclear submarine core design, this is the shipping port commercial power plant in Pennsylvania in the US, built in the 1950s. And really, every reactor since then has been this same type of design. 
So all 104 nuclear power plants in the US and almost all of the commercial nuclear reactors worldwide are this conventional design called a light water reactor. And the problem with this is that it means that all of the utilities and vendors and construction companies that do nuclear things are only familiar with this one type of design. So it makes it very difficult for new technologies to break into the industry. So that very briefly is where the nuclear industry is today. And then the next few slides are gonna talk about where it might be in the future. So for one thing, the future might not be in the United States and it will likely be in China. Um, so China has 14 operating nuclear power plants and another 21, yeah, 21 under construction. And then it has another 50, 51 that are planned and then 120 that are proposed. So that's 212 nuclear reactors in China as compared to the 102 in the US and around 400, 430 that are operating worldwide right now. And they're also spending a great deal of money developing new designs and, and building new designs. So it's quite likely that the future will be there out of all of the countries in the world. Also, the nuclear industry today is a lot younger. So this just really roughly shows the age distribution in nuclear. You see a big peak around 70 years old, then 30 years old, another peak with a big gap in the middle. And that gap was caused directly by Chernobyl and Three Mile Island. So in the late 1960s, or sorry, late 1970s, early 1980s, after Chernobyl and Three Mile Island, all of the engineers that could switch into other fields who were at the start of their career, they did. They said, all right, there's probably not going to be a future in nuclear. I'm going to switch to mechanical engineering, material science, chemical engineering, some other branch. So you have this really, this big manpower gap where there weren't really very many new developments going on in the industry. But now there's a, there's a whole new group of, in, of nuclear engineers who are all around 30 years old, who are my age, who are coming into the industry fresh. It's untainted by Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, and people are just, the young people are very excited about solving the problems with nuclear. So in particular, safety, especially in light of Fukushima, and the waste problem. Now, waste in particular is a very big problem. Each of the nuclear power plants, each commercial plant produces about 20 metric tons of high-level nuclear waste each year. So that means that 9,000 metric tons of nuclear waste are produced each year worldwide. And most of this is just sitting above ground in barrels. Like, no one knows what to do with it yet. It's just waiting for a solution. And that's actually where my company's technology comes in. I co-invented this with Mark Massey, who's seated in the back. I'm going to make him stand up later on. Um, <laughs> uh, so we came up with the design for, I just had to embarrass you, Mark, thank you. Um, <laughs> we came up with the design for a new type of nuclear reactor that can run entirely on nuclear waste. And it generates an enormous amount of electricity. So if you take all 270,000 metric tons of nuclear waste that exists worldwide today and put it into these reactors that we designed, you can produce enough electricity to power the entire world for 72 years even taking into account increasing demand. So it's, it's really exciting stuff. And also, it consumes the waste as it turns it into electricity. So a conventional reactor, like I said, produces about 20 metric tons of waste each year. And our reactor only produces uh, like around five to 10 kilograms of waste each year. So, the reason this works is that conventional reactors, the old submarine designs, are not the best at extracting energy from the nuclear waste. They use a solid fuel, solid fuel pellets like in the picture, that's held in place with a metal scaffolding. Now this metal scaffolding and solid fuel can only stay in the reactor for about three or four years total before you have to take it out because it becomes too heavily damaged by being in the core of the reactor. Keeping it in for such a short period of time means that you can only extract about 3% of the energy that you could conceivably get out of the fuel. And so that's in part why the waste is so dangerous, because it has so much energy that's left in it. So I'm going to quickly go through this sandwich analogy that I stole from Mark. Um, 
So let's say you're a starving grad student. We came up with this when we were starving grad students. You're hungry, you make a sandwich, you take one bite out of it, 3% of your sandwich, and throw it away. You're still hungry because you just had one bite of it, so make another sandwich, take a bite, throw it away. So if you do this enough times, you can eventually be full, but you've generated this enormous amount of waste. And what our reactor does is eat all of this radioactive sandwich waste. It's based, right? Um, so it's based largely on an earlier design that was developed in the 1960s at the Oak Ridge National Lab in the US. They came up with a way to use a liquid fuel rather than the solid fuel that I showed before. And this liquid fuel, it has a number of great safety benefits that they were able to prove out. Um, and what Mark and I did was figure out a way to change some of the materials and geometry of the reactor core to make it a lot smaller, cheaper, and also able to run on waste. So we can take the fuel pellets from a conventional reactor, dissolve it in a liquid salt, and put that into our reactor core. Now, unlike a solid, a liquid can withstand much more damage. So we're able to keep the fuel in the reactor for decades instead of just three or four years. And that allows us to extract about 96% of the energy that you could conceivably get out of the waste rather than just 3%. Um, this also means, because you're extracting so much more energy, it means that the majority of the waste is not nearly radioactive as conventional waste. So the conventional waste is radioactive for hundreds of thousands of years, but the majority of the waste that comes out of our plant is only radioactive for a few hundred years. It's still a long time, but humans can design repositories that last for a few hundred years. Now here's just in my last few minutes. Um, <laughs> so here's just a very rough schematic of what it looks like. You have the liquid fuel that flows through the loop on the left there, then heat exchanger, boil water into steam, drive a turbine that connects to a generator. Now this, you might notice this looks a whole lot like what was in my first or second slide that I showed, but just with a different heat source, a different thing inside the black box. Now, um, ooh, okay, I have time to talk about the safety benefits just in my last, my last thing here. So these are the same safety benefits that all of this broad type of reactor has, all molten salt reactors have, and what they proved out at Oak Ridge 40, 50 years ago. Um, a conventional reactor requires a continuous supply of electric power to constantly pump water over its core to keep it from heating up catastrophically. So that's what happened at Fukushima. They lost their electricity, so they lost their cooling water, and they had a meltdown. But a liquid-fueled reactor doesn't have those same constraints. Uh, what we have instead is what's called a freeze valve at the bottom of the primary loop there. It's made out of a solid plug of the same type of molten salt that's flowing through the primary loop. The solid plug of salt is electrically cooled so that it's frozen. So if you lose electricity, you lose your cooling to the plug, it melts, and all of the salt flows out of this primary loop, just drains by gravity, into this auxiliary containment. When it's in the low, flat auxiliary containment on the bottom, it's no longer what's called critical, so it's not generating nearly as much heat. And it's able to cool itself and freeze solid over the course of about a day, just using entirely natural convection and conduction. So if you lose electricity in this type of plant, you don't need any operator action, really anything. It just coasts to a stop over about a day. Now, just in the last minute here, I, I'm using this slide semi-ironically, but I think it's just important for people to challenge their preconceptions about nuclear power and realize that there's this whole set of new designs out there, new people in the industry who are interested in and excited in solving all of its old problems, solving the waste problems, solving the, some of the safety problems that exist. And it's, in many ways, it's, it's a new field and I find it to be a really exciting one. So thank you all so much.